this is going to be a little combination of what I, I spend a lot of time going to schools and conferences all over the country and talking to children who I love the best and um, also to teachers. And, and I also am a professor, I've taught at um, Suva in Albuquerque and also at the Santa Fe University of Art and Design, which is now closing. Um, and I just recently finished my Masters of Fine Art in um, illustration. So, especially now that I, the school is closing, isn't that great? Um, so I'm going to take you a little bit through myself, my work, and at the same time I'm going to interject different things about contracts, copyrights, and licensing. And please, if you have questions that pop into your mind while I'm talking, um, that's fine. You can, ask, you can ask me a question. And then I'll definitely leave time at the end so that if we can talk about other things. So this is a drawing I did when I was seven. <laughs> and um, I found it when my mom gave me all my stuff like, you know, they, how they give you the boxes and stuff. I dug through and I found this and I was like, wow, I haven't changed at all. <laughs> it, it says, happiness is to be alone and draw and to have cats and ponies and all kinds of animals all around. <laughs> so I actually, I, you know, I wanted to be an avant-garde artist and I went off to go to, I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and I did sculpture and video performance and I did all this crazy stuff. But you, know, you come back, I think somebody told me that you are at seven who you are. <laughs> and, and so I think that's it. I came back to being seven. I draw better. But, um, but that's what makes me happy. And then this is a drawing I did um, when I was like 11. And it was my first published work. Oh, it's kind of blasted out. But um, it was uh, my, my horse Jug, and it was in West, uh, Western... Horseman magazine. I'm going to show you in the beginning some of my gallery work or what I fine art gallery work. Illustrators, you know, I like to do um, this kind of work too. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about it, my process at all, but if you have questions about it, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Um, but I, I work in acrylic and these are on different surfaces. So I'm just going to kind of go through these. I'm into whimsy, and, um, and I'm into doing different things with compositions and looking at things. Um, I was very interested in something you said about edges. Was that Paul? Yeah. So we'll, we're, I want to talk about edges. Um, so my children's books, I actually have 32 published children's books now. Um, this was actually my very first book. It's called I Eyes, Bears, and Condors, and it's an ABC of endangered animals and their babies. And it was actually done all in pastel uh, <laughs> for the Pastel Society. Uh, and, and actually, I worked, I started working in pastel because um, they just saw something in my portfolio, and my pastel work was just so much stronger than the watercolor, because I really have never liked working in watercolor. So my agent at the time says, well, throw it out. I said, OK. And then this book was in pastels, too. It's called The Seasons at Our House. And it has these little step pages and little cut, die cut windows. And I had a, then I had a series of board books. And, in, and after a lot of my pastels would get ruined when I'd have to ship them off, you know, our directors would come back with, they wiped it. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, what were you thinking? Um, and then uh, I said, well, I need to start working in, in, some, in some ways that it can't be damaged. You know, now we send in digital images so you can do anything you want. So these are actually very watercolory, thin acrylics. Um, and some of my other books, this is, you might be familiar with this one. This is E is for Enchantment. It's a New Mexico alphabet book. It's also done in acrylic, but a little boy at a book signing says, that looks like pastel. I said, well, it's not. <laughs> so I developed this, this technique of working on black paper to emulate that. Um, I also did this Southwestern board book series that was also bilingual. Um, and then I write some goofy stuff. This is Giggly Wiggly Worms, um, a finger puppet book. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 
novelty work. This is, this is called novelty books when it has a little toy or something attached. But you stick your fingers through the puppets. Um, this is another series of books, nature books, the, called the Beastie Books, Hungry Beasties, Sleepy Beasties, Playful Beasties, and Noisy Beasties. And um, these are Lift the Flap books, so that's also considered novelty. Um, these, these three, and I wrote and illustrated those. That's when I first started getting really textural, and then it just increased more and more. And this is um, uh, readers that I didn't write, but I illustrated for it. They're, you know, step into readers for a little bit older kids. And here's some more that I did for another author. So I won't concentrate too much on, oh, I showed you those already. I won't concentrate too much on the industry of children's books, but if you have any questions that you want to ask, what I'm really here to talk about is um, the business side of what we do as artists. So um, in your handout, it says, what is copyright? And the first thing you have there. And so I, I kind of want to ask somebody if they want to just take a stab at what copyright is. Does anybody want to? Yes. Right not to be copied. Oh, well, kind of, yeah. That's a good answer. Does anybody have another thing? She likes her puns. You're the first person to. Well, actually, you know, I, when, and when I was doing my research for today, I saw that there's like so much you can read about the copyright law and how it's changed over the years, but you don't have to put a C after your work for it to be copywritten. The minute you have an idea, whatever it be, you put it on paper or you put it some, in some kind of form and it's copywritten. So copyright is a form of protection provided by the laws of the United States to the creators of original works of authorship. That's what I have here, including literary, artistic, drama, dramatic, musical, and certain other intellectual works. So it's a law that protects you. And um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about some forms and things that you can fill out. You don't have to register with the copyright office, but it's good to do if your work is going to be reproduced. It's a, it's a step that further protects you so that if you are infringed upon, then you can go after um, statutory, um, you know, you, can, you, can, you have more weight. But it comes down to who, who wants to go to court. <laughs> and that's the way it comes down to a little bit of that. So I'm going to circle back around um, and talk more about copyright, but I'm going to show you a little bit more work. This is my, my newest book. It's called My Hike in the Forest. And I brought copies here. Um, some of them I'm going to show you lots of pages. I actually wrote this some time ago, and it was just recently published by a publisher, new publisher in Connecticut. And um, this, this works. So it's, it's like a very quiet little story about, you know, like a, like a kid's journal as they hike through a northeastern forest. And then I created the borders were done, painted separately, and then put in digitally. But all of my work is analog. I was telling Betty that now the word is analog. What does that mean? It means with real paint, real, real hands. Real, it's either digital or analog. We used to say traditional. I work traditionally, but that makes us sound old, right? Um, I just know now the term is analog. Um, and this is something interesting. Uh, I'm not gonna. I might talk a little bit about marketing. Um, this is something that I created um, as as marketing tools for the book. There's like a little scavenger hunt, and this will be on the website. And the little bingo game, a nature bingo game, um, that I use in schools or download like an extra activity. So um, also, I, do, I told you about novelty books. So novelty books are something that has a little toy. Um, and so all of these books that I've done, that I'm showing you now, I own the copyright to all the images. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about 
how it works beyond that. Here's my Giggly Wiggly Worm book. And um, I'm used to reading them. If you want, we'll read them. But, <laughs> um, but it's pretty cute. So see how the little um, puppets... So I had to design the whole book and design where the little, um, the little holes would be. So are the worms like fabric? Yeah, they're like fabric. I didn't bring one of those books, but they're fabric, so you can wiggle, wiggle your fingers around. Purple worm slimes over moldy cheese. Purple worm yells out, yip, yippee. He wiggles and giggles and tickles your knee. So it's like, it's like counting colors. Orange worm slips on a banana peel. Orange worm hollers a happy squeal. He squiggles and giggles and tickles your heel. Pink worm chomps on a juicy beet. Pink worm shouts out, what a treat. He higgles and giggles and tickles your feet. Five little worms in a compost bed. Each little worm is tickled and fed. And now that we've come to the end, it's your turn to wiggle, it's your turn to giggle, and then tickle a friend. So if you want to tickle each other, <laughs> now is the time to do it. <laughs> The little kids, they all, I have to get, I have to do that clapping thing to get them to stop. <laughs> so uh, this is called Sleepy Beasties. This is actually a, a little six by six board book. Um, it's one of the series of beasties. And I also, so I do borders in some of my books. A book? It's a board book is something yeah. that kids chew on. <laughs> <laughs> So instead of paper, it's it's done on board. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I know that's good if you ask me that because there's a lot of industry words that people might not know, or if you don't have a child that chews on books. Um, so I really love doing this. I do a lot, a lot of research for my books, um, tons and tons of research, and we're going to talk about research and re how you use reference. Um, for a lot of books, I actually will go, I mean, I didn't go and photograph these animals. That's owls doze in the daytime. It's amazing how so little words can mean so much. Um, I've also done a lot of magazines, posters. Um, the, in this industry part, I, st I own the copyright for this, um, and, uh, and usually they are just buying the rights to um, reproduce it for just that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. This is where you can always notice in the front of the book, um, you know, the Library of Congress and, and all the copyright and who owns what. And um, so the publisher does not own the copyright. They just have the right to have to, to create a book, and um, it's very similar in a way to licensing. You're giving them the rights to do that, and what kind of rights? And usually they want. Uh, they have these contracts now to. They they want the right to reproduce it in any form that will ever be created for the extent of the world. You know, um, <laughs> and you know, or, or movie rights. Are they going to make a movie out of my little board book? I doubt it. So um, you can have a lot of that stuff taken out of your contract, and um, I think it's a good idea to just kind of familiarize yourself with that, um, no matter how your work is going to be used. Nisi, how long does the copyright that you hold last? Oh, so that changes, but it's for, I think it's for my life plus... Yeah, 50 or 70 years or something, and, but then your estate can, can renew it. So um, the other thing I was going to talk about a little bit was um, public domain. When something's in, in a public domain, it means that the estate did not uh, re-register the copyright. So like I could name some books that are public domain, domain like um, Velveteen Rabbit, um, Pat the Bunny, you know, there's several things, you know, all the fairy tales, you can do renditions, the Mother Goose rhymes, all that. It's really easy now with the internet to search what's public domain. 
Excuse me? <laughs> really? Wow. I, I, know they, I know happy birthday, the estate went back and registered happy birthday, so um, be careful singing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> There he is tricking three lazy lips. So now I'm getting really extreme with my texture, and you can see it more when because uh, they're I'm blowing it up. Is it textured paper or the way you paint? I uh, I put uh, thickened gesso on my paper, and then on the gallery work I, I do it on board. I use super heavy super heavy gesso. And this is a baby gecko soaking up all. She's getting like a rainbow suntan. <laughs> And this, this is my favorite compositions. This is baby snake falls asleep, coiled up in a circle. So um, one of the other things I want to talk about, so E is for enchantment. One of the things I learned um, with, because I like to do licensing, and I've liked, I like to do other things with the artwork. And so I usually always um, do not, you know, they always have a clause that, any rights not granted in this, you know, remain the artist. So if they can have the right to the book, but I want to be able to make, do use the images to be on merchandise, or I want to do whatever I want to do with it. So this one actually really panned out because it the book has individual. It's it's not really like a regular picture book. You know, it's an alphabet book. So each one image stands on its own. This is all that yummy food we have here. I was so excited to do this book. The publisher said the way I talked about it, says you should work for the tourism board. And I said, well, I really like living here. And I thought my technique works well for stucco. <laughs> and uh, adobe buildings. And I live right off the turquoise trail, so I'm in plain air all the time. I have a question. Yes. What did you have to arrange with Taos Pueblo to use that? Um, I, so that's interesting. So when I worked on this book, oh, that's great, because I was going to talk to you about some of the things. So I have some stories about infringement, and um, there started to be some... Um, some infringement that there's some buildings that are considered themselves a trademark. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I, this, this book did have Smokey the Bear in it, and they, the publisher didn't want me to use anything that had to do with um, the real Smokey the Bear. It couldn't look like anything, the park or anything. But um, I, I found a couple of interesting stories about how um, the artists have won, and I, I'm going to share those with you, but for the ta I changed it enough that you know it's Taos Pueblo, but I don't, you know, I don't say it is. So this is where um, you, I use, what I do is I use a lot of different reference and images to create my own composition. I don't take it straight from a photograph. So, you know, I guess Technically, um, maybe the tram, I did an older version of it. They could have given me a hard time. Um, the publisher and I talked about it, you know, so uh, it seems to be okay. The only one they were worried about was Smokey the Bear. Uh, and Georgia O'Keeffe, I used her likeness. I didn't recreate a painting of her. Um, and, you know... Roswell doesn't care what you do with them. <laughs> so, they really, they have these signs. <clears throat> and, you know, I, you know I, don't, I don't think there's any problem reproducing flags. I, I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's the Z symbol. The yeah. Yeah. Well, the Z symbol is like, really, if I see it on one more thing, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> but, um... You know, have to, but, but it's but if I'm showing it on the flag, it's it's okay. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit to, about licensing, and then we'll come back and talk about infringement. Um, so licensing 
is copy is licensing copyright rights to a client to use a work for a particular purpose for a particular length of time. The artist is still the owner of the copyright. So with children's books, that's why I try to tell people it's kind of like licensing, excuse me, as well. But um, when I started doing some licensing, um, I started, you think, you think of products mostly when you think of licensing, but licensing has become a word that they just have gone crazy with. There's a licensing expo that's been going on for years and it's in Vegas now and they license everything. They license, you know, Picasso's name on cigars, uh, um, you know, Frida Kahlo, anything is, is licensable. And, and it really got its big boom with licensing for products and everything is with peanuts. Um, I think Schultz was one of the first people to really license his work. And then some artists, you know, will never do any offshoots of their work. Dr. Seuss never did until he, he died and then his family ruined him. So, um, you know, the, uh, the guy who does Calvin and Hobbes, he never wanted to have anything licensed from his work. Some people don't, don't want it, and you have that right to do that. But if you want to continue to um, do more with your work, so what I did with the enchantment book is I've done prints. I've done little offshoots. I've, I've uh, licensed to a mug company. And I've uh, done all kinds of things. Now, when you do your work and then you sell like Giclée prints or high-end prints, that's you're not really licensing it because if you're in control of selling it, but if you were to upload it to one of those sites where people print on demand, then that would be a type of licensing. But they still wouldn't own the copyright. So this was an image that I was. Um, commissioned to do for a puzzle company and this one too um, and this is what the coyote one looks like and you know you can make great money at puzzles I'll tell you because you're you, it's paid in royalties usually did I say that in there yeah yeah it's usually paid in royalties um, and if the, so if it's sold, you know, you get paid, every business has a little bit different way that they, um, that they pay you, but it's usually in royalties. And so I think on that one dog painting, I mean, I made more money off one painting than anything. Is that um, a puzzle? That was a puzzle too, a shape puzzle. Cool. They go out of print and, and so usually with this type of arrangement it's like like puzzles are usually three years some and you get like a small little advance and um, and then you get like five percent of the wholesale kind of thing and and you know it in children's books is all um, picture books are all royalty based too so when you go to register and or you read something about copyright They'll, they'll, you can copyright something if it's published or unpublished. It doesn't have to be reproduced. And then there will be a little box to say, if, if mark whether it's work for hire. And this is something people get really confused about. But work for hire is when you give up your copyright. And like if you're working for an employer, you work for an employer who then the copyright holder, they become the copyright holder. So you may get credit but they become the copyright holder. And so I try to stay far away from doing anything work for hire, but there's times when I have, and it's usually for educational stuff like this. Um, and sometimes you can always ask if they can just have first edition rights. Um, when you do a work for hire, when you do, <coughs> somebody commissions you to do a painting, that is not a work for hire. You still own the copyright. Did you have a question? Well, my question, if you could differentiate between work for hire and a commission piece of work. Um, a commission piece of work is still yours. Right. And you need to, I, I'm, I, was, I talked to you in here about having forms, different forms. I would definitely state that you are, that they can't do anything with it. Yes? In, in general, uh, the, the line between work for hire and commissioning, one of the things that's been uh, done in the courts, uh, what the courts have decided is that the 
um, a work for hire, one of, the, one of the main pieces of evidence is someone withholding taxes from you, treating, truly treating you like an employee. Basically cutting you a check, taking out all the, all of the uh, deductions that we normally take out at, at, as an employee. Commissions are, uh, other than that, beyond that point, if, you, if they're just giving you a certain amount for a, a piece of work, with nothing, ta no, no taxes or social security, anything like that, uh, that taken out, you have a pretty good case for being a, uh, not a work for hire. Yeah, except that um, I, as an independent contractor, have done some things where I signed a work for hire, and they and I, well, I pay my might, own that taxes. Might be in your, that might be in your in your agreement with them. That that's right. a matter of contract law. That you know you can you acknowledge you you, you are you know it's you exercising your right to say that it's a work for hire. You're I wouldn't. I, if you if I was when I'm commissioned to do a piece, I give them a, a, a little letter of agreement that states that I'm the copyright holder, and they can't make Christmas cards out of it. Uh -huh. um, you know they can't do anything with it. They can't reproduce it. So I, to me, I think it's really. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, agreements and contracts, they're so cumbersome. They're so easy to find simple forms and make them user-friendly. And they don't have to be legalese or anything. But, like, if you work with a gallery, if they don't want to do a contract, just turn around and run. I mean, I, I wouldn't trust them. I think you should have some kind of an agreement. Um, and you, if they don't have one, you can provide one. You say, well, this is this is what I want, because you don't know. Um, that handshake thing has kind of gone the way of the dinosaur, except dinosaurs are coming back. <laughs> um, so, you know, and then I've talked to people where they've wanted to do something, else. you know, it's like, usually these educational publishers won't do anything else with it, and it's work that maybe I don't really care about, or maybe I was just desperate for work. Um, so uh, we're going to work for hire. So we, we talked about licensing and, um, and some of the things that fall under licensing. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But I'm going to introduce you to my cat, Boo. Um, he knows his name. He, he lays here. And um, when things were kind of slow in publishing, um, he uh, whispered an idea in my, in my ear. And he says, you know... You've always wanted to do something kind of dark and creepy and fun. Why don't you do this something called Zombie Zoo? So um, I decided, and of course he says, and make sure I'm the main character. And it, he still is the CEO, and he has creative um, he has creative input into into the corporation. So um, when I came up with the idea and I started brainstorming about five characters that I wanted to be the main characters, I knew, I've always wanted to do toys, and I said, I'm going to do this on my own, and then license it back to a publisher or somebody. So I'm still in the process of licensing it back, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about Zombie Soup. So there's five characters. There's Rob. He's, um, he, he does slam poetry regularly at Zombie Zoo, and, um, and he, um, he's a very deep thinker, and he's a good listener with those big ears. Mm -hmm. Toxic is a little red snake who has to win at everything. She's really good at break dancing. Um, Boo is a voracious reader and an explorer, and he's the leader of Zombie Zoo. And then we have Muck, who's the party animal, and he's super hyper. Um, and he just wants to party all the time. His favorite thing to eat is animal crackers and popcorn. And then we have Stitch, who's obsessed with cleanliness and tries to scrub the other zombies down and do their laundry. And it's kind of hard when you're a zombie. Um, but as I show you some of the zombie zoo images, I want you to think about things because then we're going to talk about trademark. So, um, so I own this. My corporation owns that word. And if you do anything with that word, you're infringing on my trademark. And I'm going to explain the difference between trademark and copyright. They're very, very different. Um, I've, and this, so this is the first book I did. It's called Where's Boo? 
here's the title page. This is the creepy page. <laughs> um, so it's written in first person, and I also did like a little video for it and everything. And it's where they go, um, this is where Boo is the greatest explorer in Zombie Zoo. He's always reading something to spike his curiosity and go off to explore some faraway place. We usually know where Boo is or where he's going. Most of the time, we can find him hanging out in his tree. But sometimes he just disappears. <coughs> And none of us knows where he is or if he's coming back for snacks. So it's a little adventure where then um, they can't find him. So they go looking for him. And, um, of course, Stitch squeals in. Eek! Something terrible must have happened. And then Rob talks like this. He goes... Oh, Stitch, you're such a worrier, said Rob, as he chewed his pencil. Now you got me tripping. <laughs> so each one has their own little personality and their own little voice. Um, and I love this in my favorite pages. I was not sure about that, but I have to admit, I was curious and hungry, too. So we all kept one eye out. And the next time their Boo started to slip away, we followed him. We followed him through the trees and walkways, past the broken cages, and beyond the lost forest. This was a place, the area of the zoo, that I had never gone. It was dark and quiet. We had to be careful not to make noise so that Boo wouldn't hear or see us. But before long, we realized that we weren't following Boo anymore. We lost him. We had also lost our way. So they get lost and they get scared. And then Boo is up in the tree. He knows where they are. And then uh, they go back and uh, back Rob um, to Boo's tree. Rob recites his new poem. Toxic performs her new power set. While Stitch ran new bath water with bubbles. And me, well, I, uh, before I knew it, all my new popcorn was gone. So there's a happy ending, of course. Um, and uh, so this also is a, is a trademark. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. First, I'm going to introduce you to the toys. So I brought... Excuse me. Yeah. two separate trademarks, so you have to trademark. Ah, I'm going to explain that. Okay. So um, these, these are my toys, and I made the prototypes, and then I had them manufactured. And yes, the only place to have toys manufactured is in China. Um, <laughs> And I did little mini ones, and I did big ones, and Boo outsells the others five to one. He just, he's, people love their black cats. Here's a picture of the large plushies. Um, and then I launched them at the International Toy Fair in New York, and I've done the whole gamut, and now I'm really trying to um, take my whole package. I also created a, I don't know if anybody knows what a style guide is, um, but in the industry, uh, you create a style guide, and I, I brought my printed one, if anybody's interested, wants to flip through it, and it has, it's like the Zombie Zoo Bible, so it has the poses, and it has the logos, and the colors, you have to follow the, a certain Pantone color if you're going to reproduce it, um, it has product development, patterns for clothing, um, Hats, belts. I'm, ne I'm never short on ideas. It's just short on money. Um, <laughs> even created designs for band-aids. Do you have to create all the illustrations yourself for the style guide? Um, for the style guide, I had them. Um, I had a, a, a friend help me create vector images so that they can be blown up, and so they're much flatter than my kind of work. And then, and then it's really easy. I just do all that in Photoshop. Yeah. So let's talk about trademark. So trademark, you, they do need to have an R on it. And, I, and people do this too, the TM, but that is because it's not a registered trademark. This means registered trademark. Now, you, it's not like copyright. It's not like you're automatically protected because you're using it. 
But if you are using it, and then you can prove that you used it in commerce, then that's okay. But a trademark may be a word, a symbol, a design, or a slogan, or a combination of words and designs that identifies and distinguishes the goods or services of one party from those of another. So if you go back, well, let's go to this one. So this, this logo, crazy thing I came up with, um, I registered this first. And, um, and so, and, and it's distinguished by all of the, the marks. But then I also went back and registered just the word zombie zoo in all times Roman to just for extra protection. Um, and you do have to go through, um, on the handout I've given you a link to the trademark office, but it's the patent and trademark office. Um, and you, you, you do, it's, it's expensive, you pay a fee. Um, and they do a search, so it's good to do a search first. I thought this was something I needed a lawyer for, and um, after doing it, I, you don't really. Um, but if, you're, if you feel like you're going to do it wrong, but they make it pretty easy on the website to register a trademark, and then you can do a search for a word, and you can see if it's already being used. Um, the first thing I did is I, when I had the idea for Zombie Zoo, is I was like, well, i got to get the domain name. Maybe there's something else out there so um, to have a website. So I have a very funny story about how um, the domain name, I, I was able to get zombie-zoo.com, but the zombie without the hyphen was somebody was, they call it cyber squatting, somebody was holding on to it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just thought, well, I get the trademark, and then I'll approach them and get the other domain name. But soon after I got my website up, I was contacted by this guy, this guy who's, who, his name was Mike Hell. Um, <laughs> was really Michael, but he spelled it Mike Hell. And he, um, he said, oh, you know, I have the domain name without the hyphen. Would you be interested in it? I'm thinking, oh, he's going to want a lot of money. Because some of those they want, like, thousands. I was like, oh, okay. Cool, what would you want for it? And he said, uh, $100, a set of zombies, and if you promise to never promote that god awful Tom Petty song. <laughs> so, I don't know if you know there's a Tom Petty song, song called Zombies. This is when I knew it was my calling because, and then I, after all, I said, So why, what's with the Tom Petty song? And he said that he used to have a nightclub called Zombie Zoo. See, if he still had the nightclub in business, that could have been a conflict. But that would be a goods and, and that would be services and not goods. So, um, and then he said he asked to go to a Tom Petty concert, and he and he was told absolutely no. And he wrote some words about Tom Petty, how he hated him, and um, I don't know. It was kind of funny. Uh, so, it, you know, I was like, okay, I guess I better not name a character Petty. <laughs> um, and. And you know, if, if Tom Petty's estate wanted to give me a hard time, but I've already had it in service. So I've had many infringements uh, that I'm going to talk about. There's, there's books out there, self-published books, that the title's called Zombie Zoo. Um, there's a, an interesting infringement that I had to spend a lot of money on. Um, is, is one that somebody said, oh, there are these toys at Target. They look a lot like yours and they're called zombie pets. Mm -hmm. And every lawyer I sent it to said, absolutely you have a case. So they took it on a contingency and we settled out of court, but you know, it's not like I got rich or anything. The lawyers are the ones that make the money. <laughs> <laughs> but um, trademark, unlike um, copyright, is you have to always protect your trademark and you have to re-register it after so many years. So there, it's a little bit more cumbersome. But one of the things I also wanted to point out to you with trademark is as an artist, even if you're not interested in having your own trademark, you have, to, um, you have to worry about infringing on somebody else's trademark. So I have a little story I'm going to tell you that I read about um, a trademark and a painting. And um, we're doing okay on time? Yeah, we're getting there. 
Um, there was a painting, I'll shorten it, that uh, an artist named Jeunesse Cortez, she was sued by the New York Racing Association because she had done a painting of, um, of the horse, a horse on the racetrack. And uh, have you heard of this one? No. No? I know the, I know the horse, though. Oh, do you? Okay, cool. So um, it, it said Saratoga in it. So she got sued by them. She, um, she was, it was dismissed. Um, was, she was covered by the First Amendment. And, but then she was also sued by the owners of the horse cigar um, for the horse's image. But she was, uh, that case was also settled in her favor. Um, but there's also some other ones about, you know, it, actually in the book that I'm going to show you, you know, about using landmark buildings, it's getting harder and harder, you know, like the Statue of Liberty, how to use it. So you just kind of have to do your research. You have to do your research and you have to see. And, and I think what, what, when they really object is if, what kind of money you're making from it. Um, so, yeah, well, it's, yeah, if, who's going to lawyer up? And um, that's right, and it's going to get harder and harder in even places like New Mexico. Because I see at the licensing show, I see towns licensing their name. You know, I saw Aspen. It's a tree, too. Yeah. I, you know, so, um, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and I don't want to run out of time for this, um, you know, because you, if you use a, a registered trademark, also as, as a writer, you have to give credit um, where it's due. So instead of saying Kleenex, you might want to say tissue. Um, yeah, don't say scotch tape. Some other related topics is, uh, is what we're talking about, infringement. Um, there, so infringement also is part of the, um, you know, there's an Invasion of Privacy Act. So I thought this was really important for you to share. The Marilyn Mon Monroe estate controls the image of Marilyn Monroe. When an artist executed a painting and had 5,000 prints made, the estate caught wind and took the artist to court. The artist tried to give the estate a royalty, but they would not accept the offer. The artist was told by the court to destroy all of the remaining prints. The estate personnel made certain this was done by going to the artist's studio and assisting him. Um, so you just want to be careful with that. Uh, you know, um, another artist had a wonderful offer from an art publisher. The publisher wanted to reproduce the painting she had created by copy copying a photograph originally taken by a professional photographer. This is when you really get into trouble. Photographers do not like that. She called the photographer to find out if he would sign a release to allow her, to, um, her painted portrait to be published. Even when he was offered a royalty, he refused to give her permission. She had infringed on the photographer's rights by copying his photograph. I suggest taking your own photograph. Um, so that's, those are different types of infringement. Um, you just need to, you know, I would really suggest going to the library and getting some of these books. Um, this one is, you'll think it does, it won't do anything for you because it's a, it's a pricing ethical guideline handbook for um, the Graphic Artist Guild. And so it mostly co covers illustrators, designers, <laughs> comic book people, everything. But there's tons of forms in the back you can use. And there's lots of stories about um, artists and how they infringed on other things. And actually, the artist who did the cover spoke at um, my M MFA program and talked about how he had changed all these things because he had, you know, uh, all this different all these different products that um, were, were he was infringing and they wouldn't let him do it. What's so, the title of that again? Um, it's in, it's actually called I always say it wrong. The Graphic Artist Guild Pricing and Ethical Guidelines. And anything by Tad Crawford, who's an arts lawyer, will, a lot of forms, and he has some great books. That's also on the list. Um, I found this to be really helpful, the Art Marketing 101, and this one, Getting Your Shit Together. <laughs> or maybe it's just getting your shh. <laughs> um, but uh, you, you know, all of these cover copyright and everything. Um, so those are those are all in the handout. 
So public domain, we covered that, so you know if something's in public domain. So if you're, if you're going on the internet and you're finding images to use to, to draw from or whatever, just, just check before you do something with it. And what I do, and I'm just going to give you an example, because I do, the nature stuff I do, I learned a long time ago, especially with books, I have to sign in my contract, it says that I'm not infringing on anybody else's rights. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm like held to that. So I wanted to show you how I, I'll use one, two, three, four, five, six, I don't know, I just, all different photographs, maybe um, field guides to create this. So I'm not infringing on anybody's rights because this is my composition. Um, and then, you know, I have to check to make sure, you know, it's not the western wild turkey, it's the eastern. But do you see how I might, you know, I, I maybe I tilted the head even a little bit to get a different pose. Um, and, I, and I made it uniquely mine. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, that's something I think is really important when you're doing research. Um, and then, um, so this brings us, to the Marilyn Monroe story brings us to the models released. Who, who in here uses model, model releases? Who, who draws from models? You should all be getting models releases. <laughs> I believe when you're at a certain place, a studio, maybe the model has signed a release for the whole studio. But if you ever use private models and stuff, it's a really simple form. You can find them on the internet. Just, just have them release. Children especially have the parent um, sign the release. If you're going to be creating them, you need a release. Uh huh. Um, I did a composition in New Orleans, and the backdrop was Brennan's restaurant. But there's nothing in there that says Brennan's or, you know, it, it looks typically New Orleans. So, you, you know, it, you may not even realize it's right. a restaurant. The other thing, there's street musicians and dancers. And, the, and so would that require... I, and they're in public. Yeah, I believe that anything in public like that is okay. okay. But you, but I would, I would read up on it because, because there's people out, you're drawing people in the street all the time anyway. I think it's more crucial um, if they're sitting for you um, or you know you've hired a specific model um, you know and I, I do if it's somebody for a book I'll do that. Um, one of the things people always ask me is how to protect your own artwork on the web. Excuse me because of course I don't know if any of you've been infringed on but I people take my stuff all the time. Um, the only, the bit best that you can watermark your work, a watermark doesn't even show up on mine, so I don't use it. Um, photographers use a watermark a lot. If you see it on a photograph, don't steal it. <laughs> but um, you can usually see, I think Google has gotten better about saying if something, you know, they'll say on there that this is not public domain. But um, to protect your own work, my best advice on your website is to keep it low res. So I would keep it 72 DPI or less, and that means if they print it out, it's going to look like crap. So um, I, that's that's the best advice I have. Um, you know, about even that, I I I have one piece that I've done this Day of the Dead piece that. People will contact me and it, they ask to use it and say, well, it's all over the web. Everybody else is using it. And I'm like, well, <laughs> and then, then you have to pay me. So um, that's something that is just really, that's the best advice I can give you. Um, so I want to talk about the forms and contracts that I've listed for you. Um, is just copyright registration form, the visual arts one, the, mo the models release, a cease and desist letter is um, what you send if you see somebody infringing on your work. They can be really nasty or they can be really nice, but the people receiving it always think it's nasty. <laughs> um, artist gallery agreement, very important. A non-disclosure agreement for submitting ideas. 
sometimes you'll be submitting ideas and, and, and but um, it's, it's hard to get people to sign a non-disclosure but it's it's a good thing to have and then a non-compete clause um, commissioned artwork proposal and agreement I would always do an agreement with a commit commissioned piece of artwork because you know how people are like eh, I don't really like it now or I don't know doesn't look good on my living room wall not the right color, not the right color. yeah I gotten that before um, a licensing agreement and and licensing agreements are all different they can be really confusing and then just kind of an all-purpose purchase order um, there's so much more that I could talk to you about because there's just so many layers and layers but um, we're getting not we ran out of time do, do I do we do a question in the, yeah that image right there if I wanted to uh, use it for inspiration if you want to use what for inspiration that image, yeah. oh blue yeah yes um, how much would I have to ch change it uh, before uh, um, well, that's a pretty simple image. Um, yeah, you mean just flip it? So that's something that I was told 10% needs to be changed, but um, yeah, how do you, I don't know how you, how you do that. And um, one eye. Yeah, just one eye. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's really, it's really, it's, it's a hard thing, and I think it's whether or not um, you want to take a chance or if you're, what you're going to do with it, where is it going to be, is it going to create money, is it going to be published. Sort of the ethics of it. Oh. Yeah, there's like moral and ethics, and that's why this book is really good because it talks about that a lot. And, and I know they have this at the library, too, if you don't want to buy the, the whole book. Um, Anybody else have a question? Can we talk about ethics for just a second? Sure. A friend of mine was working for a children's book publisher mm -hmm. as a freelancer. They asked for five idea sketches for a character. He submitted five idea sketches and they were accepted and he was paid. Six months later, the Purple People Eater came out from that company and guess what they were using? One of his sketches and they denied him anything. Hmm. And that's pretty unethical, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so you can go two ways. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm talking to you to protect you, but protect yourself the other way. Obviously, he didn't have a good agreement. Well, this was like 25 years ago, and this one-time use only contract was not in use then. Right. Yeah, when, you really when, have to... When the client bought your piece of artwork, it was theirs and they could do anything they right. wanted. And a lot of times that they think that, but, that's, but legally it's not the truth unless you've given them that. So that's why it's good to arm yourself with, well, no, that's <coughs> not true. Nisi told me that's not true. <laughs> uh, yes. If you have a firm approach you about, uh, it's a firm that does the um, setting up the decorating like for a new hotel or mm -hmm. whatever, and they want to use your artwork on the walls, so you're going to be, uh, I, I suppose, signing a licensing agreement to do that. What, that, would not be, that would not be a licensing agreement. They, um, they would, um, they, they don't, only if they're reproducing, but then they would just be buying the artwork, I believe. Not buying the artwork, they're buying permission. They're 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 wanting permission to use the images for to oh to reproduce. To reproduce that would be licensing. So licensing it. Right. Are there any big red flags or, or anything that you can think of that should be asked about that or or made sure of that you can think of? Um, I would do research on and and find other artists who have been in a similar situation or contact the other artists who are at that. It's a hotel or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a firm that's doing it for a hotel. Oh, like an art consultant. Yes. 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 Yeah, you, should, you should have an agreement with the art consultant, and then you should want to know what the agreement is the art consultant has with, with the client. Okay. Yeah. It would be a good idea to have a time limit on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Time limit on how long they can use it. 
unless they're buying it out, unless they're actually buying the actual paintings, but it sounds like they're yeah, reproducing they're it. Yeah. yeah. You can also limit the number of copies uh -huh. that they can make. A lot of, a lot of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually, buying the copyright does not, um, or buying the painting does does not affect the copyright? Absolutely not. Don't let anybody tell you what it does. When you sell a painting at a, um, when you sell a painting to a, a gallery or to a private person, and I used to give agreements to all the, but just, just because if it's something that's already been produced in a book, I wanted them to know that they don't have the rights to do anything else with. A lot, there's a lot of stupidity in the world. So, um, <laughs> People just don't check. They think, oh, it's hanging on my wall. It's mine. I can do whatever I want to with it. Um, just like if you bought this book, it's not yours to do whatever you want to. And another just thing addressing what you were saying is in terms of doing a commission piece, Margie had someone approach her about a commission, and what they gave to her to do the commission of is something they took off the Internet. So oh. I had to find out who that was, and I contacted the original photographer. So that's another thing. Oh, oh, yeah. I asked his permission because I was not going to paint his right. beautiful that's, photograph. That's and it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. just took it right off of the yeah. Huh. And and he was really cool, and he gave me an all clear and go for it. And he said nobody ever asks. They oh, always yeah. paint. <laughs> That's so, right. That's a great so it story. It worked out okay, but I had to tell them that right. I could not do it until I had specific permission, and they were kind of surprised. Good. <laughs> yeah. My question is, I took a photograph at the Range restaurant in Bernalillo one time of an old rancher sitting at a table. I did not ask his permission. He was away. He was a wonderful character. He wouldn't probably have liked it, but I found a painting of him. <laughs> that I've entered in shows, where am I in that? Of course, I, I doubt that he will ever see it. Mm -hmm. He didn't look like <coughs> yeah. when he goes to the shows. But, you know, I did. Yeah. Bad assumption. But his daughter, right? <laughs> yeah. So, should, I mean, should I not enter I, You know, it's one of those things that's kind of kind of iffy because he is in a public place. Um, I ostensibly was taking a picture of the artwork behind him at that restaurant. But he's in the photo. Oh, but you what? you didn't paint the art. You didn't paint the artwork. No, I painted him. <laughs> so there's a page in um, the Guild book, um, and and I'll just read you a couple paragraphs. Maybe this will help. Um, you know, <coughs> artists have a liability for privacy and likeness issues and copyright infringement. So uh, a person's name or likeness without permission is an invasion of privacy and claims may be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for an infringement. Advertising or trade means virtually all uses other than factual editorial content of magazines, newspapers, blah, blah, blah. So the test of likeness is whether an ordinary person would recognize... Um, oh, that man. Yeah. yeah. The person in the, in the, in the artwork. Um, an artist... If an artist copies another work, a photograph, for example, making an illustration like what we were talking about, then you have the infringement of the, of the photographer. Um, but given the substantial amount of photography used as reference, uh, you know, it's just to, they just say to be really cautious. I, I don't think there's any hard set rules about it. Um, I, I found that normally it's if, People will go after you if they're if you're making money. Otherwise, it probably would be thrown out of the courts. If yeah, not likely to make money off. Of right. <laughs> too bad. Yes. Um, incidental references. <coughs> if you do a portrait of somebody and for whatever reason it looks like somebody else, although um, you didn't intend that to be and you sell this portrait to be reproduced and it starts making a lot of money, what happens then? <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't look like them? You, were, you did a portrait and because maybe you wanted to change something or whatever, uh, bush, your eye, bush your eyebrows or uh, high cheekbones or something, but it ends up looking like somebody else. And they find out that you're making tons of, tons of money on that 
uh, poster that they're making, what 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 happens there? I don't know. It depends on what they want to do with it. Just tell them it's not here. Have your original <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't intentional either. You, they would probably have to prove that you were intentionally trying to make a portrait of the person that it looks like. You know, sometimes it's, it's good to be. It's good to have the knowledge, but sometimes if you're too paranoid, it'll take all our creativity away. So, um, yeah, one more. Going back to the using somebody else's photograph, if you. Include after photo by so and so yeah. in your title? Is that? Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. Um, you know, Norman Rockwell did all his own photography. I mean, you were, he was amazing. And actually, all every artist usually, I mean, they use reference of some kind. Um, I it, set up your own scene, take the photograph, have a photographer you work with. <coughs> You know? Yes. I was in Savannah, Georgia, in one of the squares, painting away one of those beautiful old mansions. And this lady came running out the front door onto the steps and says, you can't paint this house. It's copyrighted. <laughs> and of course, I just kept painting. <laughs> <laughs> she finally gave up. And I found out it actually was she has protection because that was the house that was at the Garden of Good and Evil. And she got tired of people making money off of her house. But I didn't know. I was just painting an old house. Yeah. And that's what's in here. There's also a part in here about using landmark buildings um, and how that's becoming more. So if it's a historic building, uh, a, you know, a, a trademarked building, they, they can do that. I. I she should probably protect it a little better than just coming out and yelling at people. But you did something. Yeah, that's interesting though. Yeah, who would know? <laughs> One more, and then we should wrap it up. Well, there's so many churches around. Yes. Everybody, everybody has seen it. Not just in the house. Everyone. I know. I've never heard any. Any kind of I know. I, I showed you. I painted uh, Chimayo. I know. Everyone paints that church. <laughs> I know. So it, it brings up a lot of questions. But you know, I think it's it depends on how they're trying to protect it on the other side. So um, all right. Thank you so much.